written the book titled uh, uh, Laws We Need to Know. Uh, <coughs> we have relatives with mental illness. Darren Miller has been a researcher. He speaks all over at groups. He also has a loved one with schizophrenia himself. He's a writer and lecturer on legal issues involving mental illness to boards, to corporations, to police wars, uh, to universities. To, you know, he, he is a longtime member of NAMI. He's an advocate for NAMI. And I'm really looking forward to what he has to share with us about the laws we need to know. You can put your questions in the chat box if you want, but we will not be opening it up to questions till after he finishes his book. It's not a long talk, but he has lots of laws he wants to share with us. So let's listen to Baron Miller. Baron is from San Francisco, and he was nice enough to come into a Zoom meeting in Westside, LA. So welcome, Mr. Miller, and the meeting is yours. Thank you very much. I, I, I assure you I'd much prefer to be in Westside, LA, and, and for it to be possible for me to be there. But um, this works. Uh, actually, I think if you, if I'd been asked a year ago or so uh, if I could envision addressing an audience on a Zoom call, I likely would have said something like, what in the world is a Zoom call? But here we are, uh, once again, humbled by forces beyond our control and trying to learn effective methods to deal with some of those forces. The idea behind my book is to enable all of us to understand the often complex government rules and programs that are applicable to people with mental illness so that we can better help them. It's a simple idea. Uh, the actual writing of the book, however, was quite a bit harder. And uh, people I know who have, have, have a copy of the book have, have uh, commented that it looked like it might have taken me a while to put it together. Uh, it does have a lot of information in it. And they asked me how long it took me to, to write it, um, given that I do have a full-time law practice and, and I'm not just writing this book. And my answer is that it took about five years. And that was five years of writing and rewriting and rewriting. Uh, but actually, if we go back to when I first encountered the subject matter, uh, we could say that it took about 30 years to write it. Uh, my personal story is a type that I think all of you are familiar with. For the first 13 years of her life, my daughter was bright and cheerful and lovely. And um, at age, about age 13, she started exhibiting behavior that was a bit antisocial and irrational. Uh, and they were things that seemed different from a rebelliousness that might be expected from someone who's 13 years old. She was able to get help in school and she was able to get help outside of school. And it was hoped that the situation would correct itself with time, but it didn't. It slowly deteriorated. And in 1990, at the age of 15, she moved into a new phase of uh, a new phase where she was having wild delusions and an assortment of hallucinations, and the hospitalizations began. The diagnosis was schizophrenia. Her psychiatrist at the time told me that the prognosis for teens with my daughter's symptoms fell into three categories. Over time, the symptoms would stay the same. They would get better. They would worsen. Hers got worse. Back then, I knew virtually nothing about mental illness. Uh, I didn't know much of anything about laws related to mental illness either. And in the ensuing 30 years, like all of us, I uh, became quite knowledgeable about mental illness. And I also uh, became knowledgeable about the laws related to mental illness. 
And with this legal knowledge, I found myself help, helping other parents and supporters of persons with mental illness. And the focus of my law practice changed. It turned out to be good for all, uh, because as we well know, our burden lightens a bit when we help someone else with similar problems. I receive a lot of calls and emails asking for information, and I always freely give it. Uh, some people, usually those more proficient at um, acquiring wealth than I am, have said that I should be charging for the information that I give. And um, really, I would like to be able to do that. But um, the reality is that when someone in distress calls me and asks me a question, it isn't possible for me to send, uh, to ask them to send me a retainer and then I'll answer their question. So I spend some time with people. I give them the information that I think they need or they think they need. And, um, and we go from there. Um, sometimes those calls might turn into a, uh, an attorney-client relationship, which is nice. And I figure it all evens out. And um, I'm pretty certain that it, that it does. But at some point, it became obvious to me that it would be quite a bit more efficient if the people who were calling me had a written resource that they could access with their questions. Uh, not that I don't want them to call me, I do, but it would be okay if they didn't need to call me and if they had the information. So I thought I could write something. I thought I could put together a book that would have the information that, um, that all of us need. And, and I did. I did put it together and I did publish it. The book covers numerous topics, and I'm going to read to you from the table of contents now, just with the chapter titles, so you have an idea of what the, what the book is, is about. <clears throat> chapter one, communications with authorities and institutions. Chapter two, hospitalization. Chapter three, arrests and criminal justice. Chapter four, restraining orders. Chapter five, government programs and benefits. Chapter six, liability of supporters. Chapter seven, estate planning. Chapter eight, ABLE accounts. Chapter nine, protecting assets and preserving public benefits after a windfall. Chapter 10, authority to act for a consumer. And uh, Sharon, I have used the phrase consumer in the book and it's ex explained why it's being used in the preface. And, um, and it's because it's become a commonly used term and, it, and it's an accurate term for someone who, who consumes or uses mental health, government mental health services or non-government mental health services. Chapter 11, consumers financial obligations. Chapter 12, rights and obligations related to housing and employment. And the last chapter, 13, strategies for dealing with recalcitrant authorities. The section on the right to housing and employment is a bit of a bonus chapter, I think, as it clarifies bigotry and why it is unfair and wrong and why we shouldn't tolerate it. Uh, it applies to all forms of bigotry, not just against persons with mental illness, and uh, it's my own favorite chapter. This book explains many federal laws and programs and also many California laws and programs. 
I am uh, often asked if the book is useful for non-California citizens, and it most assuredly is. Uh, by far the most significant laws that uh, pertain to persons with mental illness are um, federal laws and federal programs. Um, and uh, certainly I couldn't possibly list all of the uh, laws or pertinent laws of, of all 50 states. Um, but I do know that the California laws uh, presented are generally representative of the laws of other states. Uh, I now would like to read a little bit from the preface and then a little bit from the afterword. The preface explains the book a bit. The afterword contains some uh, good advice for all of us. From the preface. People afflicted with severe mental illnesses so serious and debilitating as to impair their abilities to care for themselves need assistance and support from others. I think that those persons who provide that needed help will benefit from a resource that explains pertinent laws and legal procedures and is, in, and is available at their fingertips. This book is written primarily for them. This book is also written for those persons who suffer from severe mental illnesses and who are frequently referred to as, quote, high functioning. That is, those persons who are able to care for themselves in many important ways and perform many daily tasks without assistance. I think they too will beneficially use the information here. This book is also written for the lawyers and social workers and doctors and nurses and everyone else who find themselves in need of a reference source for information concerning severe mental illness. There are numerous laws and government assistance programs and government protection procedures that exist for consumers. While they provide varying degrees of benefit, all of them are valuable. The value can only exist, however, if consumers are able to access and use them. The laws establishing programs and the rules and processes which control them are often complex, sometimes too much so for most of us to fully understand. A purpose of this book is to provide enough information and explanation to enable the mental health community to understand the laws and the government programs and processes so that we can help consumers and supporters to the fullest extent possible. This book tries to list and describe the most prominent laws and programs pertinent to mental illness, that is the ones we are most likely to encounter, to explain how they work and to offer tips on making them work effectively. Footnoted references to applicable laws are presented when it appears that this would benefit readers by enabling them to obtain additional information which would assist them in understanding the law. This book will not replace a social worker or a lawyer when one is needed, but likely it will reduce the number of times one will be needed. I sometimes say that when my child was diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1990, I knew next to nothing about mental illness. And since then, like most caring parents of mentally ill persons, I have become an involuntary expert on the subject. The expert part is intended as an ironic overstatement of the awareness that I as a parent have acquired, but certainly I have been compelled to obtain a lot of knowledge about mental illness and the laws pertaining to it. Almost daily, I dispense this knowledge to the mental health community, and I will continue to do so. At the same time, I hope that my advice and the advice of other attorneys in this field will become complementary to this book and vice versa, and that the mental health community will be able to readily look up and beneficially use the information that is provided here. And now I'd just like to read a little bit from the afterward, uh, which I think um, contains some good advice for, for all of us and things we should perhaps keep in mind. As supporters, 
one of our goals is to maximize the assistance we can provide our consumers. Knowledge of laws and how they operate and of available programs for consumers will keep us in an optimal position to deal with legal issues and to help as best we can. Yet, while a good understanding of laws and legal procedures is necessary, the help we give may still be limited, just as we have learned to accept that there is no cure for a severe mental illness. We need to understand that sometimes there may be no way to take advantage of laws or, or programs or to resolve a particular legal issue. If a consumer is intent on obstructing attempts at assistance, she may well thwart our efforts. All of the knowledge in the world might not enable us to get benefits and assistance for a person with a severe mental illness if her symptoms include a resistance to accept help. Sometimes it is the persons administering laws who are, who are a greater impediment to our efforts than any limitations which might exist in those laws. Occasionally, we encounter employees of agencies and businesses who seem as though they are trying to block our efforts. For a parent, often the very best thing that, we, that can be said to someone whose assistance is needed and who is disinclined to give it is something like this. My child needs help. She is innocent. She is vulnerable. <clears throat> and she can't help herself. So I am trying to help her. It is a simple, accurate, strong, and often irresistible message. It should move most people. It is the unspoken message I receive every time I talk to a parent of a consumer. Sometimes with some people, it needs to be said directly out loud. Some wise person once remarked that a major difference between those who succeed and those who don't is persistence. With that in mind, we need to keep at it and we need to know this. When we are caring for a consumer, there is no one in this world displaying a greater mixture of courage and decency than we are. Whether we are acting due to love or due to a sense of duty or to a combination of them, we are doing things no rational person would ever voluntarily choose to do if a reasonable alternative existed. That is a fantastically complimentary statement about us. It is something we should be proud of and it should keep us going if nothing else will. Sometimes we do get worn down and weakened when we feel as if we have hit the wall and all we want to do is cry or scream. On these occasions, it is good to try to keep in mind another way of perceiving our situation. Instead of focusing on our exasperation, perhaps we should pay attention to the fact that while it is overwhelmingly difficult to deal with the mental illness of someone we have a special relationship with, we are in fact doing this overwhelmingly difficult job. Unlike so many people whose simpler lives contain so much that is trivial or superficial, a type of life we tend to often wish for, each of us is someone who makes life better for someone else. And therefore each of us is someone who has achieved a status of importance. Someone whose life has a significance someone whose life is worth living. Of course, we will do what is in our power to do, and hopefully we will recognize that there are things beyond our power to do. We should never forget or ignore how valuable we are, nor the eminent position we have achieved, nor the myriad opportunities we have to enjoy our role. These are, after all, returns on our investments, and we have earned them. The book, Laws We Need to Know, can be purchased from booksellers um, um, uh, that are open uh, and booksellers online uh, like Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any, any bookseller online. Uh, they can be, it, the book can be uh, purchased in either a print or digital form from um, 
online booksellers. And it can also be purchased uh, just in print form on my website uh, where special pricing is available for anyone who needs it. Um, so just say you need it or just whatever you say, I'll go along with it. It's, it'll be fine. Uh, my uh, website is www.baronmillerlaw.com and that's um, my name, Baron, B-A-R-O-N, M-I-L-L-E-R, L-A-W, my name uh, with law.com. So um, that concludes my uh, prepared remarks and I would like to um, hear anything anybody has to say and um, answer any questions that I could answer. Um, Jaron, you're, yeah, there we go. Did you have your hand up, Betty? Was that you, Betty? Yes. Uh huh. Yes, go ahead and ask your question, Betty. Well, I just wanted to say just from the chapter titles that it sounds like a really terrific resource and I actually already ordered it this morning. <laughs> so um, I, uh, you, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, it's the, it really lays out the struggles that we all have and the planning that we must do. And I, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you have included such a variety of topics. You know, the estate planning is something that, you know, I think we all have to eventually think about. And I, and I think that it's wonderful that you've got that in there. Um, uh, and, and so I, I just feel like, um, you know, the other part of it for me is the advocacy and the fact that we struggle so much with current laws as far as, um, you know, that are designed to protect people, but make it so difficult for families. Um, you know, like the confidentiality laws. And I just kind of wanted to hear what your viewpoint is on that. Okay, thank you very much, Betsy. I, um, uh, first of all, I wanna say that um, my law practice is um, today is mainly doing estate planning for uh, doing estate planning and, and mainly for uh, families with, uh, family members with mental illness. So um, I really do have uh, quite a bit of, of knowledge in that field, but I didn't want to limit the book just to that field because it's, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's basically uh, two or three, it's one major chapter and parts of two other chapters, but I wanted to include other things. And one of them was this uh, problem that all of us experience uh, or most of us experience, I think, of communicating with medical providers. And um, I do go through the laws. I do promote the idea that the laws are not very good the way they're <laughs> set up. And uh, by enabling people who don't know that they need help um, to prevent those who most want to help them from helping them. Um, so uh, there is a there is a call for action there, um, as well as an explanation of of what the the laws are, um, which is probably a little bit too involved for me to talk about now. Other than to say the obvious, which is that um, there there are uh, physician patient and um, psychotherapist patient confidentiality laws, which exist, which uh, sometimes are uh, followed uh, beyond the point that I think they need to be followed. And uh, there are exceptions to the laws that do, do allow uh, medical people to uh, communicate with us without um, their patients consent or authorization. Um, and uh, that information is in 
is in the book and uh, it's good information and it's good information to uh, impart to doctors and nurses and um, psychotherapists if needed. So that's it. Thank you, Betsy. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? I think Berendini has a question. Yeah. Oh, um, just Mr. Uh, Ferrandini. How do you do, Dean Ferrandini? Dean. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, briefly, I, I my daughter seems to have followed the same path that your daughter did, uh, although maybe a bit deeper. Um, she got herself into some uh, uh, legal difficulties, and uh, eventually, uh, through a lot of effort on everybody's part, got herself back together and back out into the real world. Although, uh, as much as she would like to participate in the real world, uh, her, um, her legal difficulties have followed her. You know, they, they, uh, they, they go to check up on her background and she has this stuff. Now we've been told that, uh, that a lot of these things can be brought off or taken off and run to like a misdemeanor or, or taken off expunged from her, uh, uh, from her um, uh, record, and she would be able to then maybe, uh, which she's having difficulty, just getting just a basic job to feel as though, you know, she's part of society. She, we, we've got her on, she's on disability now, and she is financially, as long as she doesn't go too far off the rails, she's sort of okay, but she would like to participate. What's your best suggestion to, uh, uh, to us following forward and she was almost three strikes when we when we were able to turn her around. Okay, um, so uh, I, I'm concluding that she's uh, receiving medicine. She gets medication now, and she's taking it, and and it's it's working. And she's she's actually able to hold a job and is applying for jobs. Is that is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, I, yeah, there's a couple things. Uh, one is, yes, there, there is a way to expunge some crimes from uh, a person's public record. Um, the, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you if you want to give me a call or send me an email um, and I can find out specifically from you what what crimes are on her record and what possibly could be done. Um, you could also talk to somebody locally, um, possibly a criminal lawyer, uh, someone who specializes in criminal law, um, who might, and, and who works in, uh, I'm assuming you're in Los Angeles or is that? Yes. Yeah, so maybe somebody yes. who's familiar with the Los Angeles criminal courts and knows their way around and has done this before there and um, might be able to give you uh, more specific information than I can. Um, and then the other thing I would suggest is that, um, is this, I, I don't know that it's illegal. I think it is not illegal to discriminate against somebody who has committed crimes when um, hiring or not hiring them. But, um, but I do know that it's illegal to discriminate against persons with mental illness in hiring or not hiring them. And um, what I'd suggest, and maybe this runs counter to one's intuition, but I would suggest it is that um, she, if she's not already doing this, that she inform the uh, potential employer that she has whatever her diagnosis is and that she has a history of uh, acting in ways that are controlled by her illness, but that she now has the illness under control, that she's now uh, taking uh, medicine for it and that um, she expects to be treated fairly. And um, that's yeah. an idea. 
So now, Mr. Miller, it's not. It is against the law. It's written out in the Disability Act, but uh, it happens. It happens. They are discriminated against. Oh, for sure. A future employer that you have yeah. schizophrenia. It, it happens to so many of our young people here in NAMI. And, um, you know, I just want to say, Dean, and, um, uh, uh, you know, I just want to say, why don't you call me? I do have attorneys that work with mental illness only in estate planning, and they will probably know an attorney, a criminal attorney who works only with mental illness, if That's you right. call me. That would be great. After yeah. actually, after listening to him, it sounds like uh, his fees would be right in line with what we figured. <laughs> yeah, well, you could. I'm just me. kidding. I'm just kidding. If you, need, if you need another lawyer, please call me here in LA because I might be of help with that. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. And get buy his book by all means. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Okay, please. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other questions? I have a question. Oh, here's Mitch. a question. Uh, yeah, who, who has that question? Mitch. Is that Dick? Mitch. Oh, Mitch. Hi, Mitch. Hi. How Hi, are Sharon. you? Hi, Sharon. I see you have a question here. Go ahead. Um, a lot of us here, I assume, have an LPS conservatorship. It's been quite uh, helpful for me. My son has not been in a hospital now for over three, three and a half years now. Um, my question, I have two questions. One is, uh, do you see anything that should be changed with the LPS conservatorship to make it better, if you're familiar with it, which I assume you are? And what steps, what other uh, steps do you think we should be taking besides having a, a conservatorship? Because it certainly helped me navigate my son's recovery. <laughs> Okay, well, um, an LPS conservatorship is a type of, a, a very special type of conservatorship that uh, exists primarily to um, enable the conservator, uh, the person who operates the conservatorship, the person who's in charge of it, to place the conservatee in a locked psychiatric facility. Um, so they're um, allowed and issued only in um, very specific circumstances and um, they um, can only be petitioned for uh, with the court by uh, the county where a uh, proposed conservative, uh, the person with the mental illness, is residing. Um, the conservator is almost always the county, but it could be also um, a parent or an individual. And sometimes counties will uh, welcome a parent as a co-conservator, um, somebody who can, can do, do the legwork. And the, conserva the county will do the, the legal work. They last for a year and they're uh, renewable uh, once a year. And they're only issued, they're only issued under uh, circumstances where someone is a danger to themselves um, or to others, uh, or um, someone is gravely disabled. Um, the, um, the problem with the LPS conservatorship, well, there are, there, are, there are more than one problem, but the main problem, the huge problem, is that there aren't enough uh, facilities to house and treat all the people that have, uh, that are dangerous to themselves or others or are gravely disabled. And that is, I think, obvious to all of us, and it's obvious to all who, who have no personal connection to mental illness. We see people um, all over the streets every day and have for decades. And these are people who are gravely disabled, or a good number of them are, um, who are um, frequently dangerous to themselves or to others. 
And, but without question, they're unable to take care of themselves and they're not getting help. They're not getting LPS conservatorships. And the reason they're not is because it, there's nowhere for them to go. And there's nowhere for a court to, or a conservator. They're, to also, <laughs> they're also very difficult to obtain. Do you, do you think it should be easier to get a conservatorship for uh, a family member? Well, it's, um, I don't know if easier is the correct word that I would use, but um, the, it does seem like a, an unreasonable burden at times, especially if, um, well, if there's resistance and it's necessary to go through a trial, um, then um, it's an awful lot of time and effort and work and cost to put an LPS conservatorship in place. And, and it may not get put in place. But can I say that yeah. um, it's one of the other benefits that's helped me with my son is that it's given me um, access to give the doctors and other health workers or you know even in jail when my son was arrested for stealing a soda um, I'm able to speak to the doctors and give them information and help them understand what the situation is with him and so it's not only for getting him put into some kind of a facility but it really helps you advocate more for them and have a voice because if you don't have a voice then they could end up where you don't want them to end up. And they really need a lot more advocacy than, you know, than we give them credit for. So um, that's, that's what's helped me. I've been able to talk to all of his doctors. And as a matter of fact, my son is in the hospital right now. And without the conservatorship, because um, we've been dealing with this for 14 years, as Sharon Dunas knows, I took classes with her many years ago. Um, but he's in the hospital now and it took having the police come to my house well the sheriffs uh come to my house one night there were 11 people here and they couldn't get my son to open his door there were three um social workers and there were um i think six sheriff's officers and then the two people that brought the ambulance and they had a gurney in my living room but they could not get my son to open the door so you know, when you feel like you're battling something that's so difficult and that you feel like you have no power, imagine having 11 people at your house not able to deal with your loved one. I mean, that says a lot because, you know, we really try hard to, to um, have control over and helping them. And when that many people of authority are standing at your door and they can't even help you, it's, it's challenging. So we're all doing a great job. <laughs> Can I just say one more thing on, on, on the subject? I, I have found that it is difficult to get psychiatrists to show up in court, that, that the psychiatrists at the, at the hospitals uh, don't really want to take time off, uh, which could be an entire half day. Uh, they're not treated with with respect there, I've been to six um, uh, LPS conservatorship renewals. Uh, I'm, I'm in my sixth year and I've seen psychiatrists have to wait there for hours. Uh, and I, I think there's a big burden on them and it should be made a bit easier for, for them to come and testify. I think that's one of the big reasons why uh, these it, it's difficult to obtain a conservatorship. So something should be done to make that easier. I mean, Can I um, just, I like, just I like, have to bring a letter from the the psychiatrist and the and hopefully a therapist. Right, right. But for but you've got to get them to come in for the first one, and that can be difficult. Now, yeah, uh, can, may I make a comment? May I, may I make a comment? I just want to say one thing, you know, Mommy and Gail Evangelides and myself, we've been fighting for years to get so a psychiatrist could have a Zoom meeting and not have to go to court. Oh, and that's a great. Conference, you know, right. with the judge. So can, they can, can stay in the hospital and just talk. 
We have been fighting for this for years. So may I make a thank uh, you, Sharon? Uh, may I make yeah. a comment? Thank yeah. you. So a um, couple things. I'm um, going back to uh, the accessibility to obtain a conservatorship. Um, right now, you have the only time you can apply, Absolutely. or the only time someone can apply for the conservatorship mm -hmm. is if the potential conservatee is in the hospital. And that is very difficult because most of the hospitals in LA County now will not keep patients in the hospital for the time involved to apply for the conservatorship and wait for the hearing. They don't meet criteria to be in the hospital anymore. So that makes it very difficult. And Nick, I think your name, I agree. You know, um, there has to be other avenues to obtaining a conservatorship other than out of the hospital because not everybody can um, get their loved ones into hospitals to start that application process. And, and, and there's I think a real pressure in Sacramento. There's a group of lawmakers in Sacramento that are trying to change the LPS requirements. They're trying to redefine the disability. You don't have to be so disabled to get a conservatorship. Right, right. right. And, and, and just as a, you know, as a comment, um, the courts um, in LA, in my opinion, are very transparent. And I think that any concern about over um, seeking conservatorships would be offset by the outstanding court system we have here in LA County in terms of assessing the situation and not automatically um, adjudicating a conservatorship just because somebody has applied. And, and I'm very encouraged about some things now because, because of COVID, the courts now are doing all their hearings on, on WebEx. And that's making it very easy for the doctors to be able to come on board for the hearing and not have to wait all afternoon uh, for the case to be called. The court will uh, call the doctor now and say, we're ready for your case. And it's all being, being done on WebEx. And I'm hoping that the courts will take advantage of how well that has, the court in LA, the court I'm familiar with, and um, how well how they will take advantage of it. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, and, and there was another thing I just wanted to mention to the woman, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, who commented or after Nick about um, getting information because you have the conservatorship. And um, you, you do not have to have a conservatorship to give doctors information. There's right. no, there, there's, right, there, there, there's no um, confidentiality protection if I'm telling you about my child. They just can't talk back to you about confidential right. information. So don't but be afraid. You can order about, medication. You can order medication me. for your loved one. Even well, if they have anastagnosia, you can order medication. And as a matter of fact, my son was given medication at four o'clock in the morning in his cell when he was in jail because he was so psychotic that he refused and he chose to stay in jail. And he, you know, for, a, for stealing a soda, it wouldn't have been a very long um, time spent, but he made it longer because he refused until I got on board with the doctor. So you do have a lot more a lot more um, access to giving more and getting more information because I was able to talk to the doctor almost every day in right. jail. That's that's great. Um, I really, I've noticed that Michael Lim has had his hand up for a while, Baron. So I'd love to hear his question for Baron. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Tim. Um, Mr. Miller, um, the my situation is that my son had his onset when he was, uh, well, this is an able uh, account question, okay? So uh, my son had his onset when he was uh, in middle school. Uh, however, as he uh, grew older, he has uh, stopped his services with the county. And um, he, I mean, he's working, he's, he's, he's making minimum wage, uh, but he is not gonna be able to support himself in the long run. Um, so when I found out about this ABLE account, I was wondering how do I 
um, how do I get him to open an ABLE account and make sure that he is, um, I guess, quote unquote, um, um, qualify for it? Uh, because I don't, I, I, you know, as an um, as an aging parent down the road, when I'm not around, you know, I, I don't want him to be decertified for the able account and then, you know, um, be caught in a in a hard place. Um, so I was wondering what, how do I go about to make sure that he qualifies for it in the long run? Maybe Mr. Miller could explain what an able account is, so we're all in, uh, understanding as he talks about it. Okay. Well, uh, an able account uh, is a. I'll just read from the chapter on able accounts. The introduction and achieving a better life experience. Parenthesis able. It's an acronym. Account is a type of financial cash account which can be established by a disabled person or her representative in accordance with federal law. And uh, so there are various um, uh, reasons to establish an ABLE account to, that might possibly benefit a disabled person. And there um, are uh, various requirements. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Lim, what you are, um, possibly hoping to accomplish with an ABLE account, but let me just say this. Um, they can hold up to a maximum of $100,000. Um, they can be contributed to, they can be established and contributed to at the rate of only $15,000 a year. And they can exist for someone who has a diagnosis of mental illness, um, which occurred before the age of 26. And um, these are things that would have to be established. The advantage of the ABLE clause is that the money can be used in ways that will not affect the, um, the disabled person's SSI or Medicaid benefits. Right, public benefits. Yes. So if your son, for example, were, if he is receiving SSI each month, um, he, part of that SSI is deemed by Social Security to exist for the purpose of paying rent. And if you pay his rent, or pay a portion of his rent, it affects the amount of SSI that he receives. It may still be worth it for you to pay a portion of his rent or all of his rent for that matter, but it will reduce his benefits. However, if he has a, an ABLE account and the ABLE account pays a portion of his rent or all of his rent, uh, that will not affect his SSI benefits. And that's the main benefit of an ABLE account. They are fairly complicated and not something that I could even explain fully in the few minutes that we have for me to talk about them. And um, there is a chapter in the book. Um, there's also a lot of information on ABLE accounts on the internet. A lot of it is good information. Um, there is, um, and I think it may be cited in my book, a website, a very good website. Uh, actually, there is a Cal Abel. Website. Yes, yes, I'm fam I'm familiar with um, okay. with their meetings. I attend them uh, oh, regularly. Okay. All right, good. And, okay. Uh, just haven't got an answer to my question in terms of. Uh, how to make sure that he's um, he he qualifies for a Cal Able account for good, uh, yeah. because I mean he's not on SSI. Um, he is working uh, because he's working and he's he's um, you know drawing minimum wage, and um, as you know in California nobody can live on that right, <laughs> on the long term. 
but the the only the only public uh, benefit that he is using is um, his medical. And medical has a stipulation that if you have more than uh, what is it? I believe two thousand in your bank, then um, you could lose that benefit. Okay, so the idea is to move his earnings into an able account to um, um, to preserve his medical. That's that's what I was thinking of. Do you, do you think uh, that that's, that's that's something you can do for sure? That's yeah, a, but do you think a that's a prudent move? Uh, it sounds like it. It sounds like it is. If it, I mean, if he's able to handle his own money, uh, then um, then he could do it himself. If he's not able to handle his own money, um, he could give you a power of attorney, and you could do it for him. Um, he's, I don't think he's going to lose eligibility in the future. I think once he, once he qualifies, the ABLE account is established and it's, it's going to exist. For, yeah. For but, you know, yeah. in all the meetings that I attended at Cal, uh, with at Cal ABLE meetings, yeah. uh, is that nobody has, uh, not even the executive director, mind you, uh, was able to uh, kind of, um, Tell me, how do I go about making sure that he's not going to lose that? Because um, all he could say was that, oh, if if you if you get documentation from the professional, I mean, he's not he's not dis, he's not deemed as disabled, right? He's not getting uh, he's not getting disability. He's not getting SSI. Um, is he getting medical because of poverty? Only because of poverty. There's no uh, yeah. No illness uh, it, it, issue or there's no insurance through his job. No. Okay. So, um, so you can apply for. Uh, you can establish an able account. You can fund it, and. Um, well, let me ask you this. What does Medi-Cal uh, say? Since you're talking to the Cal Able people, what are, have you talked to the Medi-Cal? Um, Does your son have a, you know, a Medi-Cal social worker assigned or some you know. case worker or somebody to answer a question? We have to share the time with other people. No. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, okay. Forgive me, maybe you can call him. Uh, yeah, give me a call if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see if we can. So here's a question for you, um, Mr. Miller. Yeah. What, what can we do as a community to help change the laws around LPS conservatorship? My son, uh, oh, yes. Well, you can uh, Google who's what, what Congress people uh, in Sacramento are working to change it and join them. Uh, so, um, uh, so that was a question. Oh, how, but here's a question. What can we do as, as a community to help change the law, uh, to help change what happens in hospitals, to stop hospitals from having the three day revolving door? Is there anything we can do you know, to keep, make hospitals keep our kids in the hospital for two weeks to let us stabilize on medication? Is there anything family members can do? So uh, the, uh, you know, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that question, but in my opinion, uh, what we can do is um, we can start with our own NAMI groups in um, forming the uh, position that uh, we want to take. Uh, we can use our collective power as a NAMI group or NAMI groups to lobby um, legislators in Sacramento to, um, to write to them, to call them, to go to their offices, to meet with them, to meet with their, uh, their yeah. staff, uh, to inform them of the need, uh, which um, I think they already know of the need, but uh, make it clear. And, um, and with, if 
things get done, it seems to me, things get done in Sacramento, not necessarily because they're the right thing to do, but because they're the po politically expedient thing to do. Uh, all of us are well aware of the need to keep people who get admitted to a psychiatric unit for longer than three days. And if they're getting released uh, after three days, it's because the laws need to change. And I think they'll change when the legislature is aware that um, they might lose some of their own funding from uh, or campaign contributions, I believe is what it's called, or, or, and or uh, some of the votes that they need to uh, be reelected. And then they will start treating it more seriously. And so that's, say, that's what I see as the, as the solution, just as like with all, all things that we need from a legislature. Um, I just want to say on a local level, if you will tell the doctor or the social worker that you are a member of NAMI and that you expect them to keep your, your relative in the hospital till they're stable on meds, and that you don't want your relative to come home and can't live with you, then they have to find housing for your relative. And they are required by law to find housing for your relative. And when you say you're from NAMI and you learn this in your NAMI class or support group, that sometimes holds weight with doctors because they know NAMI is a powerful political force. So, so even informing the doctors in the hospital while your relative is there. That can, and also you'll hold, if anything bad happens to your relative, if they release them too soon, you're gonna hold the hospital responsible and the hospital will be hearing from your attorneys. And conversation like that with the hospital can get the hospital to keep, keep your relative in there longer. You gotta be strong and you gotta be really tough as a family member. Couldn't agree more. I mean, excuse me for adding Mr. Miller, but I just wanted no, to- No, 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 totally agree with you. Well said. Okay, so- um, uh, Also, just a quick note, Ali Mink, um, thank you so much for sharing this great link in the chat box. If you have an opportunity, just everyone take a peek at the chat box. And there's a great link to a NAMI California event that was held this past December. So very current. Because um, we all know that these chain, these laws change frequently. So this was um, December 2020, and it was a town hall event. So there's um, a lot of information there to digest and a great resource. So thanks, Ali, for sharing with with and everybody. Cartar Diamond gave a great resource too in here. If you read what Cartar Diamond says, she says, um, if you really want to be influential, write a letter about your personal experience to the board of supervisors to Dr. John Sharon director of um, Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. Write letters with your personal story, sign and say NAMI member, NAMI Glendale, NAMI board of directors, whoever you are, <coughs> whatever you are, NAMI. Good, thank you for the Ellie and Cartar for those, uh, that information, thank you. Let's see. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I guess I don't see any other real questions. Just write, somebody says, write words that are very powerful and keep a paper trail active <clears throat> of, what, of um, what you said. It's always good to write, keep a one page document, the name of your relative, the birthday of your relative, symptoms you now see, symptom, prepositional phrases, talks too fast, insomnia, uh, violent rage attacks, whatever the symptoms are you see. And then um, uh, hospitalizations your relative has had, just the year in the hospital. And then medications he's on. <clears throat> Pass, get that to someone in the hospital, get it to the site nurse, get it to the doctor. It can never be longer than a page because nobody in hospitals has time to read anything. So one page only. And when you, if you ever have to call the police, you give the police your one page document. If you call the pet team, the smart team. Yeah, I've done that and it works. It really, really is helpful. Yeah, so uh, 
Darren, is there anything else you'd like to share with us tonight? I don't see any. Uh, well, there are there are some questions, um, but I don't. Uh, yes, I'm just a... looking quickly at the chat box, um, so I'm not sure. I see Judy I, has her hand. Yes. Up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you, or I could, but I can't anymore. What are the downsides of taking conservatorship? None. And then Brian Kraft question as well. Do you want to talk? We can now Mr. hear you. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a real newbie, um, so um, forgive me, but when you were talking about uh, um, being in the hospital, um, with, you know, um, my nephew 51 would um, and at 34 refusing to give anyone any information, refusing to, um, take any meds whatsoever. Of course, after three days was sent on his, on his way. Um, and the hospital wouldn't talk to anyone because of course there was no release of information nor would he would he sign it um so is there any advice um for a situation like that i appreciate you know give them hell but um when the hospital won't even take a call or uh, and again now with covid you're not even allowed in the door to bring them clothes or whatever um any suggestions for that, um, for us who are just starting on this road? Well, I have lots of suggestions. Um, they're actually um, in more than one chapter in the book, but there is- I've already uh, ordered your book. Oh, good, <laughs> then you'll, you'll get my suggestions then. And uh, I, I don't guarantee that any of them will work, but uh, if you don't try them, they definitely won't work, so. <laughs> yeah. You might try to come to some of our support groups on our website, um, because a lot of family members know a lot about what to do. In well, this I, I, I have it. I have it planned to start tomorrow with the the, the, the Zoom meeting that you've got. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Talk. I think if you talk to Sharon, she will have very good ideas for you. Yeah, to, call me. To, call can me. I add uh, something? Thank, uh, thank you, Sharon. I, I have something quickly to add. My son was in his fifth hospitalization. And the psychiatrist called me in and asked me what I thought would happen to my son after he is discharged. And I said, he'll probably be hospitalized for a sixth time. And the psychiatrist said, no, I think it'll be worse than that. I think your son will probably die. He'll probably die on the streets. I said, do you think you could help me get a conservatorship so I could help, help navigate his rehabilitation? His, his superior psychiatrist ruled against it and said he's not going to do it because my son doesn't um, um, the criteria. fit the criteria. Thank you, Sharon. I called Dr. Rod Shainer, who I met from all these NAMI meetings. Uh, I don't know if he still uh, has his position, but I, I called his office. He was kind enough to take my call. He called up that hospital and threatened to close it down. Uh, which would be malpractice, discharging a patient who could be killed or died on the street. And the next day they called me and the psychiatrist showed up in court. So uh, I, I have to thank Sharon so much for, for all the help she's given me and I'm sure most of you and introducing me to Dr. Shainer and now there's Dr. Sharon. And if you meet these people, at, it's hard right now, but once we get back to being in, in person, if, if you meet these people and, uh, and talk to them, then maybe it'll be easier for you. As, uh, as Baron Miller says, it, take, it takes persistence to, to get things done. And it took my persistence to call Dr. Shainer up and that psychiatrist showed up and I got my conservatorship and I've now been my son's conservatorship and that's the kind of uh, advocacy that you need. But you know, you've got to play all your tools. 
Thanks. So thank you, Sharon. Okay, thanks. Um, could I, is Judy G here? There's a question from Judy G. Yes, that's me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, Judy. Hi. So um, you, you said that your daughter, it, can I say your, can I answer your question? Yes. Uh -huh. your, your daughter's in a board and care. You're paying her rent with her disability income. If you were to help with the rent uh, or monthly payment occasionally, would that reduce her SDI benefit? Okay. So is her disability yes. income from the state or from Social Security? Do you know? It's from Social Security. It's um, yeah. disability. She was disabled before yeah. 21 with schizophrenia. So she's, is she getting SSI or SSDI? Do you know? S SSDI. And I'm her representative payee. Okay. If you're positive, it's SSDI, which is yes. also called disability. Uh, then um, you, it won't be affected by you uh, helping with the payments to the board. I, I thought you had said earlier that it, it possibly could affect uh, or reduce. Yeah, well, S, it would reduce SSI. Okay. It's a different okay. program. Yeah. Okay. So SSDI is based on uh, payments made uh, either by your your child or by you or her father. Right, right. And if you're, um, well, it's somewhat complicated, but the, the bottom line is that if she's on SSDI, you can go ahead and make payments and it won't affect the amount. If she's on SSI, it okay. will affect the amount. It would, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you for yes. clarifying that. Yeah. Yes, good. I have a yeah. Can I can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Is yes. you talking to me? Yes. Oh, okay. Hi, hi, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Miller. Uh, thank you for your wonderful words today. You're you're amazing. So um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So I have a question. Um, my son. Um, he, uh, also, I can't get a conservative from, from him, from his old psychiatrist. They would not give it to me. And we had to finally leave. And, um, we're in the process of hopefully trying to get that because he had an appointment today to see another psychiatrist that we were hoping that he was going to start with, but I couldn't even get him out the door to go. And, um, and this has just been a constant battle. And it's like, is there any type of law or anything that can help that you have to get care? I, you know, I, I don't even know. I mean, we're, we're looking at every avenue because yeah, sure. he won't yeah. get care. Right. Okay. So the only law is the one that's been talked about uh, somewhat right. tonight, uh, the L yeah. LPS that's conservatorship. Yeah. Yeah, um, there is a uh, probate conservatorship. Uh, it's a different type of conservatorship. Um, mm -hmm. It's not really going to help you because um, although it gives, if you got a probate conservatorship established, it would give you the authority to, um, to have your child be seen by a specific doctor, doctor. but uh, as far as getting your child to the doctor's office, it's not, right. there's nothing in there yeah, that's going to help you. So um, there's nothing, you know, other than an LPS conservatorship, there's nothing legally you can do. Um, it just, you, you, you're going to have to use uh, personal leverage, like yeah. uh, money yeah. often works, um, you yeah. know, things okay. like that. Yeah, okay. things like that. Okay, thank so, you, thank yeah. you. And maybe Sharon has ideas too. Oh yeah, she's amazing. <laughs> I have a question. I, have a group. Group. I run a support yes. group on Saturday morning or call me. My phone yeah. number is 310-820-4626. I have a question. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, hi, uh, Patricia. Uh, my son's been diagnosed with a schizoaffective and then schizophrenic, but now a uh, borderline personality disorder. And so my question is, is there any way that 
I could go in without having any type of the conservatorship for in, in court to help him as opposed to him just going with the public defender. Cause I feel like they don't listen. I mean, they don't, there's, they don't, they just think that, you know, they're a criminal. So, so uh, if you call me, we have, is, is it in LA County? Actually it's in Orange County. So it's for um, uh, uh, under the influence and then resisting arrest. So we're trying to, um, I'm trying to get in touch with the public defender, but they won't talk to me and he can't because obviously, you know, he just his anxiety and then everything kind of boils up. So I can't get a hold of anybody. And I'm a litigation assistant. So I'm pretty much familiar with the courts. I, I'm comfortable with that, but nobody I, talks to me. I think you should call the president of NAMI in Orange County. He's really a helpful guy. He was just on <coughs> Spectrum. <coughs> news the other day <coughs> excuse me I've got a cough his name escapes me but I'll try to think of his name before we end this meeting and put it in the chat room okay thank you he will be very helpful to you very okay, yes, so I, I, have a, I have a question for you um, you said you can't talk to your son's attorney it, do you do you call them or do you email well them? It's, what happens? It's a, it's a pub, obviously right now it's a public defender, yeah. Yeah. but there's not, I've gone through, when I look up the case, it, there's nothing in the system. We appeared, we tried to appear on the date, which was in October of last year. There's nothing in the system. So, so for me, I know I looked it up and the losses that the, the officer has to submit the case, the ticket within one year. So that'll be in June. But you know, it's kind of it's it's almost like we're just waiting on that. But and, uh, and you know, the actual department that issued the tickets, uh, you know, against him said that it's in the system and you have to speak to the district attorney. Bam, it just hangs up. But I know for certain. I I emailed the clerk of the court. I called. I've left messages. I have tracks of emails. So I'm familiar with that. I'm comfortable with that. But you know, that's as far as I could go because that's the only advocation I could do for him. I mean, he's yeah, that's, all, that's all you can do. The, if the if charges have not been brought, if the charges have not been filed, uh, there's nothing to do. Right. So, I, I yeah. know. But at this point, you go to the DMV and his license is suspended, which actually that's actually a good thing. But but again, it's still in DMA records. So something's not making it. You know, it, does, it doesn't make sense. So if there wasn't a case filed, why would his license be suspended? So, you know, it's just, it's just a lot. And then trying to, you know, give records of what happened that day. He was hospitalized after that. It was a two week hospital, you know, so trying to just solve this, I can't get anything. And it just, it's- Right, well, the, okay. So what was the, what, what was the, was he arrested or what? what he was, what he was, he was arrested for changing his tire. And I think he, you know, he got upset. Like he, he freaked out. And he wasn't on his meds and then he blew up and resisting arrest. And so they technically got him for a DUI, which he wasn't driving the vehicle. So, so those are the things that, you know, again, I can't afford to get an attorney, but I want to advocate for him to say he wasn't driving the vehicle. So how could you get, how, why would he be charged for a DUI? So, you know, all those little things. So that's why they said I have to speak to the public defender, but nobody's calling back because there's nothing in the system. So those are the things that, makes it hard because when you say he's got a mental illness, it just, they don't even listen to you. They'll just, if you know. If nothing in the system, aren't they gonna let him go? I I mean, at this point, well, he's home. I mean, he's not, he was, he was let go, but he was, we, he went ahead and was hospitalized that day when it happened. So, so. I have to say the president of NAMI Orange County is Steve Pittman. Steve Pittman, I think you should call him. I think he will have some advice for you and some help. Thank you. But I Patricia, don't... his email is in the chat. I put his okay. email in the chat for Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. And then um, Ami had a question. Um, yes. Does a, conservator a conservatorship end automatically when a consumer ends up in jail? That question is from Ami. Not, no, no. It doesn't. Well, 
Well, I, I, there's, there's no more questions. I, I, I think we have to thank Baron Miller for his wonderful talk, his answering questions. I think he gave us all hope because we see that we can read a book that will help guide us through um, problems we're having with their relatives that relate to California laws. So I bet he covers everything in his book. So I think everyone that was kind enough and had courage enough to come to this meeting should buy Baron Miller book. I just bought it during the meeting. It's gonna be uh, delivered on Saturday. So um, by Amazon. So I thank you so much, Mr. Miller for your talk and your willingness to spend time in LA talking to LA residents. I know San Franciscans kind of look down their nose on people from LA at LA. They think we're, they're superior and, and you probably are. So thank you so much. Well, okay, hey. first of all, first of all, uh, Los Angeles is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and I have family there and I have uh, friends there and I love going to Los Angeles. And uh, I assure you, there's no uh, antipathy uh, okay. from from this this area. But um, I thank you for having me and and allowing me to share this information. And um, and I do encourage people to get the book. And again, if if cost is an issue, please um, go to my website. There's a way to to contact me and to let me know that. And I'll get you, a, 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 I'll have it sent to you and um, because you need, you need the information that's in there. So, uh, so don't hesitate and, uh, yes, you and thank you. And thank you for all, thank, thank you. all of you for all you do and uh, which I know is, is a lot. Well, I will thank you so much. And I want to tell you about our speaker meeting the first Wednesday in March. The first Wednesday in March, we're having a panel of young individuals who have psychiatric diagnosis who are gonna talk about the difficulty and how they went through the beginning of their illness and how they found their way to recovery. Because each story is so different. There'll be six people on a panel next week that Aaron Raftery, our executive director has put together for us. So if you'll just bear with me, I had a fairly long poem to read you, but I. I think it's too long for tonight. I'd just like to read the serenity prayer to all of you. If you know the serenity prayer, could you please join me and say it out loud with me? If you don't, just listen. I'm going to read it. The serenity prayer. God, God grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can no. And the wisdom to know the, the, the difference. Oh, yeah. so oh, God. Think about acceptance and surrender as you go through this next month till we meet again <laughs> in March. Hey, Sharon, before, hey. We, before we say goodbye to everybody, can I just make a quick plug for the amazing NAMI support groups, family support groups, and peer support groups yes. that we have happening every week. And we've got some great new teams of family support group leaders, including Sharon on Saturday morning. We have uh, Ali Mink, who's been amazing um, on loan from NAMI San Bernardino, has been helping out on Thursday night um, with Adam Shoulder and a great new uh, group on Monday night as well. So I really encourage everybody to take advantage of these incredible oh, resources. Okay. And then Monday night, who, who we have? Jamie. Monday night, um, we have Jamie Kay, who has a great experience as a family facilitator and um, also being supported by Steph McDonald, who's an incredible member of our community. So great, great teams, great support. Want to encourage you all to um, take advantage of it um, yeah. as often as you need. I want to I wanted thank Mr. Miller, but um, my heart is out there for Brian Kraft. You, I can feel your pain. And I, Dick Stusser is here. He's, my son is 26, almost 27. He has paranoid schizophrenia. He, but Dick, we were talking the other day about if you want to visit your relative in the hospital, what did you say about being persistent? Because you will get in. What was your, can you help Mr. Kraft? Because I feel for him. Well, um, I was told that um, you, the, the hospital should be allowing one family member 
to visit, but I don't find that to be happening. Um, maybe persistence could make it happen, but it's pretty difficult now to get into the hospitals. The, the COVID thing has really thrown a curveball at being able to be on board and being able to support your loved one during hospitalization and the whole thing with confidentiality, it's, it's, don't get me going. But um, I did hear that, that there were, um, that there was some degrees of freedom there. It might've been more related to persons with developmental disabilities and not mental illness um, because the source I heard it from and the um, context in which I was be it was being talked about was someone that is um, kind of a high up in the developmental services division of the state. So it may not be the same for mental illness. All of you family members that came tonight, you're heroes and heroines and you have so much courage and and you know and so much determination to come mm -hmm. on tonight and keep learning and growing and uh, you're to be admired all of you family members that are on this call with us and and uh here mr miller is a family member too so he speaks from a depth <laughs> of feeling and experience so I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. And thank, thank you. Allie, thank you, Allie. Your words were terrific and everybody's sharing. It, it's all, we all have to support each other. It helps. And this it is helps. Janice Black Warner, our lovely woman that, because we're able to have these speaker meetings because she helps fund all of the well um, financial things to put them on. And She's been on the NAMI board. This is Janice Blackmore. And thank you, Sharon and Aaron and Tim and all of you. You know, each time you go on these NAMI speaker series, you get if you get one thing out of it, it's worth the whole thing. And and just having each other and and I'm learning each time. I, my son's been going through this many years as well. It's hard. And you think it's going to be over. It's a brain illness. Sharon has taught us all. And I think my son, I hope he's going to snap out of it, but then he's not. So we have to accept it and help it help our family members with love and understanding and compassion. And, and um, that's what we're all here to help each other. Thank you. And as Aaron said earlier, Sharon, you do a, an amazing job recruiting people each month to come on to the speaker series. You're amazing and keep up the great work. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Thank all of you. Uh, hey, thanks again for having me, Aaron, Sharon. You've got a great group. You've got a great website. I'm really, really pleased to see all this. Well, Aaron, we might ask you to join us again. Just a, a brief announcement. So everyone, um, Save, save the date in your calendar. May 1st and 2nd, we are going to have a NAMI Westside Wellness Weekend. And it will be a series of events like this. So many opportunities for engagement panels. Baron, we'd love to invite you back if you'll be so generous with your time again and your experience and knowledge. We can sidebar on that too. I'm kind of throwing this at him in front of everybody. So, um, but but it would be an honor to have you again for our wellness weekend. Oh, it'd um, be my my honor to be there. I assure you. Yeah. And, well, thank and you. If there was no COVID. Uh, Mr. Miller, you could stay, you and your wife could stay with me. Oh, thank you. All right. <laughs> I, I might be calling on you in the future. Yes, okay. I definitely have room for you and your wife. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, right. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Be safe, be well. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Thank Good you night. again. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Keith and Dean. So, Keith, you have such good news. Such good news. Such good news. Thank you, Sharon. You made 